Today's video is about capacitors and essentially how capacitors work. So we're looking at here one coulomb of charge. We're just going to imagine that this is a coulomb of charge and we're going to see what happens when we start bringing coulombs together. If you bring a second coulomb of charge in close to this one now, we learned all about electric fields. We know that we have an electric field around each charge. Those electric fields interact. What we want to focus on today is more about the energy that is caused by these two charges coming together. Now we know that when they come together, because they're both negative charges, that they're going to repel each other. And you can take the analogy of magnets here as a good way of picturing this. As you bring those negative charges together, they're going to repel, so you're going to feel a force between the two of them. If you force them together, so you make them come close, then they're going to store that energy as potential energy, like magnets being pushed together, or capacitors are often compared with springs. So like winding up a wind-up toy. And then if you hold on to it, you know that you've stored energy within the spring inside the toy. So here we've got two coulombs of charge that we have pushed close together, and therefore we have increased the potential energy that each of those has. If we now bring a third coulomb of charge into the picture, then we know that we're going to be bringing in another electric field, we're bringing in another repulsive force. And again, if we shove this in here and hold it there so that it can't move away, then we've increased again the potential energy of all of these charges. Now, there's a reason we're starting at this very beginning, because essentially with capacitors, this is what you are doing. When you connect a capacitor into a circuit, you connect it to the battery and that is going to charge the capacitor. And what that means is that essentially the negative end of the battery moves electrons onto this side of the capacitor. Remember that as you put electrons onto a capacitor plate like this, you increase the potential energy of each coulomb of electrons. So by shoving them onto one particular plate, you increase the energy. And of course, each electron generates an electric field. And when we have parallel plates, we know we get uniform fields between the plates. That field then repels electrons away from the other side of the capacitor, the other plate. And of course, when electrons are repelled away from the other side, it leaves it with an overall positive charge. Now, coming back to the energy of the electrons. So, and we're going to focus on the negative plate here. As you put more electrons and more electrons and more electrons, more coulombs of electrons onto this plate, every time you add a coulomb, the potential energy of those electrons increases. Now let's remember what potential energy is in this context. We know that the voltage is the energy per coulomb of charge. So what's actually happening here, as we add more coulombs of charge onto the plate, our voltage across the plate increases. What a capacitor is, is simply two plates separated by a material in the middle, which is called a dielectric. And that's just an insulating material. There are lots of different dielectrics that can be used. Air can even be a dielectric, although it doesn't hold up a field very well and it discharges quite easily. So usually another material is used. We don't need to worry too much about what materials are used in there. But essentially, you've got two conducting plates separated by this insulating material. The capacitance of a capacitor tells us how much charge these plates are going to hold. But it's not just about how much charge you can put on there. It's about how much charge you can put on there with the increases in energy. So for example, with a small capacitor, it may be that you can only get one coulomb of charge on there. All of those charges repel each other. They all gain potential energy. And so the potential energy in the capacitor stored by the capacitor increases. In other words, the voltage increases. So with your small capacitor, it might be one coulomb for every volt increase. Larger capacitors, for example, you might be able to get 10 coulombs on there before the potential energy increases to one joule for every coulomb, one volt. And obviously that just depends on the size of the capacitor. So capacitance is how much charge is going to be held 
by the capacitor for every volt increase. Remember, volt being potential energy per coulomb. How is it that a capacitor might have more capacitance? Again, this is not something that we need for Edexcel physics, but it is nice to be able to think about if you have a larger plate, for example. Then those coulombs, every coulomb you add on, are going to be able to spread out a bit more. And we know that pushing the charge together causes the repulsive effect to be greater and therefore the energy stored to be greater. So if they've got more room to spread out for every coulomb you put on there, you're going to get less potential energy and therefore less voltage. So the size of the plates is one of those factors. And it helps, I think, when you think about capacitance to remember that because you're thinking about how much potential energy is gained by the coulombs when you put them onto the capacitor. Now that we have figured out and understood what the capacitance of a capacitor means, we can obviously just write this as an equation. And this is the defining equation for capacitors. It is the amount of charge that you can place on a capacitor for it, the voltage across it to rise by one volt. And of course, we can graph this relationship. And so we're looking here on the x-axis and we can see that as the charge increases, the potential difference across the capacitor increases. And obviously that is a straight line because of the equation. If we rearrange the equation like I've done up here with V on our y-axis and charge on our x-axis, we can see that we get a y equals mx relationship here. You might need to rearrange this to see that a bit clearer. Plotting V against Q gives you a straight line through the origin, the gradient of which will give you the inverse of the capacitance. So that's a useful thing to remember. And you do sometimes, though, see this graph with the other axes, so charge on the y-axis and V on the x-axis. Just be careful about that. At that point, the gradient would be the capacitance. Just keep an eye on what's on your axes. What does the area under this graph represent? Now, when we find the area, we are essentially multiplying the y-axis by the x-axis. And as this is a triangle, it would be half base times height, half of the charge value multiplied by the voltage values. But let's just look at the units for a moment. We know that the volt is the joules per coulomb. And when we find the area, we'd be multiplying the joules per coulomb by the number of coulombs, which is the unit of charge. And obviously those coulombs are going to cancel. And that means that the area under the graph is going to give us a value in joules. In other words, the area is the energy stored by the capacitor. Now, this would make sense in terms of old electrical energy that we learned back in year 12. We know that it's Q times V. In this situation, though, let's remember that it isn't going to be Q times V because the area under the graph is not V times Q. The area under the graph here, so the energy stored by a capacitor, is going to be half V times Q. The reason for this half is because, of course, we don't have a constant voltage across the capacitor. What we have is a maximum voltage and a minimum voltage. And this half represents the average between those two. This equation here is the energy stored in a cell or battery, which does have a constant voltage. We can have a little play around with this equation because, of course, we have expressions from the defining equation for capacitance that will allow us to replace Q and V. So if we start with replacing Q, we can say that the energy stored, which, by the way, you will also see as W, as in the work done by a capacitor, those two are interchangeable, is a half C times V times V, or a half CV squared. And that is a second equation for the energy stored by a capacitor. And of course, we can do exactly the same thing by replacing the V. And so we end up with which gives us an energy equation of a half Q squared over C. And there's our third three ways of calculating the energy stored by the capacitor, all given to you in the data book, but these 
are ones that you specifically need to derive. It's not exactly a difficult derivation, but you need to know that it's the capacitor equation that you're substituting.